So keep your Bibles open there in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. I mean, I've got many favorite chapters in the Bible. This is uh, definitely one of them. And it's, it's definitely become a favorite since I've become a pastor. Since we've established churches, you know, in Queensland, here in Sydney, this has now become one of my favorite chapters because it deals with church unity. It, it deals with the church being one body, being in peace with one another, loving one another. Okay? And that's why I come to church, brethren. I come to church, yes, to worship God. Yes, I come to church to sing praises to the Lord. But I come to church because I want to spend time with the brethren. I want to spend time in fellowship and get to know you, you know, pray for you. I want to edify you. I want to bless you. I want to lift you up. But at the same time, I'm like you. I'm a, I'm a man. I go through weaknesses. I go through sadness. I get upset. I need you to lift me up. I need you to edify me. And we need to love, edify one another. We need to have peace in the church. And so this is such an important chapter because many churches do not have peace. Many churches have divisions. Okay? And... You might put up with it for a while. You might say, well, I go to church for the Lord. I don't care about the divisions that are in church. But when you go in there, service after service, week after week after week, month after month after month, divisions, divisions, lack of love, lack of peace, it's going to wear you down. And it's going to cause you to backslide. And we'll soon see that it's gonna, it can cause you to even be like a backsliding Christian, just, like, just a worldly Christian, just like anybody else that is an unbeliever. But look at verse number 14 for me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 it starts off by saying that we henceforth be no more children. I love that. So the title for the sermon tonight is Be No More Children. Be, except for the children. I guess you can still be children, okay? But well, we're talking about the spiritual sense. We're talking about us as believers. We should not remain to be children. We should not remain as babes in Christ, as, as young Christians. We should learn to grow and mature and that comes by being in church. Okay? It comes by being in the house of God. And so let's start off with verse number 1 there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, and I already mentioned this last, uh, last time, that Paul here is referring to himself as a prisoner, reminding the church once again, hey, he's a prisoner of the Lord. He says, I beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now that word vocation, what does that mean? It means your calling, right? It means your employment. It means your occupation. But, you know, Paul is telling us here that we ought to work worthy of the calling that God has for our lives. You know, and we, ha we, we started off by looking how God already, as far as God is concerned, we're already seated in heavenly places. As far as God is concerned, we're ready there in heaven. It's all sorted. You know, we, uh, we're, we're righteous in the righteousness of Christ. And that's how we ought to walk, brethren. That's how we ought to walk, Okay. Now, when it starts off here, they beseech that you work worthy of the vocation uh, uh, wherewith ye are called. He's talking about the brethren. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the Christians. He's not saying, you know, in order for you to be saved, you've got to walk worthy of the, of the calling. No. Salvation is the sacrifice of Christ. Salvation is the resurrection of Christ. Your faith upon that. Once you are saved, once you find yourself in a good church and, a, and settled, or even before you, you know, to find a good church, you need to walk worthy, okay? God has given us a vocation. God has given us work to do. And he now says, all right, you're saved. Great. Now start doing the works. Start serving each other. Start growing, okay? Verse number two. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. So how, how should we behave toward one another here? It said here, in lowliness and meekness. You know, we should be humble people. You know, we should learn to be humble. And this is, this is how you know whether someone's a mature Christian or not. Someone that's walking with the Lord, someone that's mature, is usually the one that's the most humble. The one who's able to just lower himself and lift up other people. You know, the Bible says in, uh, in uh, Ephesians, sorry, in, in Philippians 2, 3, it says here, let nothing be done through faith or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Better than themselves. You know what that means? It means all of you, God is telling me that all of you are better than me. That's how I ought to behave. You know, and, and for you, everybody in this room, in your mind, should every, you should say, well, everyone in this room is better than me. Okay, that's humbling yourself. You humble yourself, you lift up other people. You say, oh, but that, that brother over there has only been saved for a week. He's only been saved for a month. He's still uh, uh, walking very worldly. He still hasn't grown in the Lord. Yeah, he's still better than you. Okay, that's the instruction that God gives us. That's how you ought to look at the brethren, okay? 
And this is the, the mind that we had, that Jesus Christ had. Okay? He was someone that came. He was the Lord God creator of all things. He humbled himself as a man and he came and he edified others. He lifted up others, others that are sinners around him, right? Sinners around him. And yet he was able to love and be merciful and show kindness toward the sinners that he had, that, that he met in, in his life. But look at verse number two again. It says, not just loneliness and meekness, we've long suffering. You know what long suffering means? Patience. Okay? Because in church, people are going to start to annoy you. In church, people might do something and you might get frustrated. Well, you need to be long-suffering. You need to suffer long with them. Give them time. Give them time to warm, to warm up to you. Give them time to grow in the Lord. Give them time to gain knowledge. Give them time to learn the hymns. Give them time to learn how to preach. Whatever it is, guys, be long-suffering. And it says, forbearing one another in love. You know what forbearing means? Just put up with them. All right? Put up with them. Forbearing one another. He goes, yeah, you know what? In church, there's going to be people that you get frustrated at. This is what's being taught here, okay? But put up with it. Put up with it. Be patient. Have love toward your brethren. Look at verse number three. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, brethren, this is so important that you understand verse number three. The very first word there is endeavoring. Endeavoring to keep the unity. Brethren, you know what? Church... We're all different, all different backgrounds, all different thoughts and ideas, right? And so we're going to clash sometimes. We're going to have other thoughts, you know? And, and you, you know, unity does not come automatic in a church. It's not like you just go to church and everyone's going to be united. Everyone's going to get along. No, it says endeavoring, endeavoring, right? In the, in the, uh, to keep the unity in the spirit and the bond of peace. The word endeavoring means make an effort, You've got to try. When you come to church, if you want this church to be a united church, if you want this church to be a church of peace, you've got to put an effort in to make that happen. You know, when I was a, a more of a carnal Christian, when, when I wasn't that mature in the Lord, I would go to a church, right, good churches, and say, well, there's no unity in this church. Ah, this church, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be much peace in this church. And I, I would look at that and, and like, you know, look down on churches. Just in, not, not in public, just in my heart, okay? Until I realized, hold on, if I'm in church, if I'm a member of a church, I'm actually the church, right? With everybody else, we make up that one body. We make up that church. And if I want this church to have peace, I've got to, have, I've got to bring peace to the table. If I want the church to have unity, I've got to bring unity to the table. If I want the church to be, uh, for people to be humble in the church, I've got to come with humility, right? And, and so church is what you want it to be. You can endeavor, endeavor to make divisions. You can endeavor to make it a place of conflict. Or you can endeavor to make it a place of unity, a place of peace, a place of love. But you've got to put the effort in. It's not like you just rock up to church and, and no, you play a part in the church, okay? And you see this as we go through this chapter. Look at verse number four. Verse number four. Now, from verse number four, the next few verses um, will dictate to us what brings us unity, what brings us together in the house of the Lord, okay? And again, we, you know, if, if, it, if it wasn't for church, we probably wouldn't even know each other. If it wasn't for church, if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, we probably, like, you'd be a total stranger. I could just be walking down the street, there you'd be. I wouldn't know, you know, you'd just be anybody else to me, right? What brings us together? What brings us unity? You know, is it, is it a sports team? You know, is it the, well, I don't know, what's a famous sports team? Is it the Western Sydney Wanderers? Is that what brings us together? You know, is it, is it I don't know, what's a rugby league team? Is it the, is it, is it the Bankstown Canterbury Bull, is it Bulldogs? I don't know. They're still called Bulldogs, right? Is that what brings us together? Are, are we coming together because we, we support the same teams? You know, uh, uh, what, what else brings us, you know, what is it that brings us together? We have the same interests. I'm sure if we go through the, through the uh, you know, we saw what our hobbies are, what our interests are, I'm sure we'll all have different interests. What is it that brings us together? Well, it starts off here in verse number four. Verse number four, it says here, there is one body. You know what the church is? The body of Christ. One body, when it talks about the body there, it talks, that's a reference to the church. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1, just a few chapters, if you want to look at it, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22, have a look at it, just go back a few chapters, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22, just as a reminder, it says here, And have put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. 
The fullness of Him that filleth all in all. What is the church? The body. The body of Jesus Christ. What is this church? One body. That, that's what brings us together. We're united in one body of Jesus Christ. And then it says here, and one spirit. Brethren, if you're saved today, if you're a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. The same Holy Spirit that indwells me, the same Holy Spirit that gives me the ability to preach to you, to study my Bible, is the same Holy Spirit that is within each one of you. Okay? It's the same Spirit that we all share. That also brings us unity. And so we start off here with the Holy Spirit. And what you'll notice is, verse number 4 refers to the Holy Spirit. Verse number 5 refers to Jesus Christ. Verse number 6 refers to God the Father. Another reference here to the Trinity. But let's keep going. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. We all have the same calling, brethren. We all have the same calling from God. That is to walk like Jesus Christ, to be like Jesus Christ, to learn our Bibles, to grow in knowledge, to win souls, right? To live as if though we're already in heaven. That's the calling that we've seen in the previous chapters that God has left us. This is what brings us together. You know, if you want any business, any church to be united, we must be one in purpose, okay? And the purpose that we have in this church, one of the main purposes is that we would go out and win souls, they would go out there and win souls. And you know, I don't want anybody in this church that criticizes soul winning. That says, oh, you, what, what's the point of doing that? That's a waste of time. You know, that, you're not going to have any success soul winning. I don't want that person in this church because they're going to bring down those that have a desire, a love to get out there and win souls. Okay? I'm not saying that if you don't go soul winning, there's something like, you know, that you're, you're hurting the church. I'm saying those that are saying, hey, you shouldn't do that. And you know, there are, there are churches, there are pastors, I've heard of my own ears, criticize soul winners, criticize people that go door to door preaching the gospel. That church is going to fall apart because they're, they're not united in the, in the task that God has left us to do. Let's keep going. Verse number five. It says here, one Lord, one Lord. You know who that is? That's a reference to Jesus Christ. Again, keep your finger there. Go back to Ephesians 1. Just very quickly, the same book, of course, Ephesians chapter 1. Let's make sure you understand this. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 2. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 2. It says, Grace be to you and peace, look at this, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. A distinction, right? A division there. A difference between God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So who's the Lord? Jesus Christ, okay? Go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> verse number 5. One Lord. So we saw verse number 4, the one Spirit, the one Holy Spirit. Guess what? We also have the one Lord. You know, Jesus Christ is the head of this church. Okay, that's who Jesus Christ is. That is the same Lord. That is, a, that is my Lord. That is your Lord. That's what brings us unity in the church. This is why, you know, uh, Paul had warned, um, I forget the church now, I forget which church he warned. Anyway, uh, you know, uh, about, uh, about, you know, um, people coming with another Jesus. Another Jesus. You know, there are a lot of churches out there. There are a lot of even Baptist churches that will call the person they believe in, the person they follow, they call him Jesus. But many times, it's another Jesus, okay? And what will bring unity in this church is that we have the one Lord, the true Lord Jesus Christ, okay, who came here, he's the Son of God, he came here, he died on the cross, was resurrected from the dead, and sits on the right hand of the side of the Father. That's the Jesus Christ of the Bible, and that's what brings unity to our church, the fact that we have the one Jesus. But not just the one Lord, verse number five, one faith, one faith. Faith. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm staying in the book of Ephesians, so we understand what's going on here. Of course, for by grace are you saved through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. The same faith, the same gospel. You know, Paul also warns of people coming with another gospel, which is not another. You know, the gospel is, is, is being corrupted these days in many churches. What's going to bring, bring unity in this church is that we are of the same faith. We have the same gospel. We have the same salvation by grace through faith. That's what's going to bring unity in this church. Okay? And if, if, if you hear a preacher preaching on salvation, preaching on the gospel, please never get to a point where you're like, well, I already know this. I already know this. Why is he talking about this again? 
okay? Well, this is what's going to bring us unity, okay? And those that have another gospel, if you keep preaching the right gospel, those that have another gospel, those that have an ulterior motive to come to church, they're going to leave the church at some point, okay? Because they realize they can't bring in their heresies and we'll see this person uh, as we keep going on as well. He'll get mentioned here as well. Let's keep going there. Verse number five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. What else brings unity to this local body of Christ? One baptism. That we all have the same baptism, right? Believer's baptism by immersion, okay? By immersion, believer's baptism. That's what brings unity to a church, okay? That's what brings unity to a church. The reason we're a Baptist church, okay, is not just because it reflects what Christ did for us, not just because the body is meant to be made up of baptized believers, but he brings unity in a church when we all share the one baptism. You know, and keep in mind, these things, as we're going through these verses, these are things that are supposed to bring us unity, not division, not division, okay? Baptism is something that brings unity to this church, to this body, not division, okay? And if people are divided over baptism, it's a bad thing, okay? Because you, you, if, if, if that's the issue, if that's the problem, then you're bringing division into the church when this is what should bring unity within the church, within the body of Christ. Let's keep going. Verse number six, one God. Now we have God the Father, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And so it's quite interesting there in verse number six where it says, one God and Father of all, who is above all. And yes, God the Father is above all of us. But who else was mentioned in these verses? The Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ. You know, God the Father is above the Holy Spirit, is above Jesus Christ. He has the authority within the, the structure of the Trinity, God the Father. You know, of course, Jesus Christ, you know, not my will, but thy will be done, Jesus Christ said to the Father. And of course, Jesus Christ is subject unto the Father. You know, Jesus Christ did the works that the Father asked him to do. Jesus Christ preached the words that the Father asked him to preach. And so we see not just the Trinity there, but we see an authority structure, the Father being above all. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'll just really quickly read to you 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Because some people cringe at that, right? When you say God the Father is above Christ, some people cringe at that because it's the one God, okay? It's true, it's one God, you know? Jesus Christ is equally God as much as the Father is God. But within God, there's a structure, there's a Trinity structure. And in, in 1 Corinthians eleven three, it says this. 1 Corinthians eleven three. you can turn there if you want. 1 Corinthians eleven three. It says, but I would have you know, Corinthian church, this is something you need to know, that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Referring to God the Father. Okay, so what's the authority structure within your family? God the Father, Jesus Christ, the husband, the wife, the children. Okay, that's the structure that God has given us in, in the family. And there you can see again, uh, God being the head of Jesus Christ. Verse number eight, please. Ephesians chapter four, verse eight. We get to an interesting verse here. It says here, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high. So of course, that's talking about the resurrection of, of Christ being, and then ascending to the right hand side of the father. It says here, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. What does that mean? He led captivity captive. There's two things here. When Christ was ascended to heaven, he led captivity captive. That's one thing. And he gave gifts to men. And that, those gifts that he's talking about are spiritual gifts that we'll look at soon as we go through the rest of the chapter. Okay? But what does it mean to lead captivity captive? Okay? Now, look, just for the sake of time, I don't have time to explain this to you. But if, if you want to look this up, just do a word search in your Bible, Bible software, type in captivity captive. The phrase appears three times. Okay, and look at it. And basically it means this. That, let me use an illustration actually. Uh, Michael Jr., I'll get you up here. Come here. Let's say, uh, let's, let's, put, let's put it this way. All right. Let's say uh, Michael Jr. here is taking me captive, right? He's taking me into captivity, all right? So you've conquered my people. You've conquered my nation. So my hands are behind my back. You've got me arrested. You're leading me away, right? I'm captive. And to take captivity captive is this. Well, guess what? I'm going to now defeat you. Now you're my captive. I've taken the one that I was under captivity in. I've taken him captive. 
Okay? He once had power over me, but now I've got power over him. That's what he means. Okay? You can sit down. That's what captivity captive means. And so when Christ ascended up into heaven, if you want to turn to, keep your finger there, go to Hebrews chapter 2 for me. Go to Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. Go there. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. It's probably interesting for you to see this. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. The Bible reads, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, referring to Jesus, likewise took part of the same. Right? Jesus came in flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Verse 15, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Brethren, before you were saved, you had, you were, you were by, by Bible saying here, you were subject to bondage. You were taken captive, okay? Captive by the power of sin, captive by the power of death, captive by the devil, as it were, okay? And of course, when Christ came and died, he delivered us from that power. Jesus Christ says in John 8, 44, speaking to the um, unsaved Jews, or to reprobate Jews actually, in John 8, 44, he says, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. He said, the, the devil wants nothing more than to destroy mankind, to destroy uh, you know, the, the people that God has created. Jesus says he was a murderer from the beginning. The reason why he came and tempted Eve, the reason why he did that to cause mankind to sin, is that he would murder mankind. And of course he does that by them dying in the sins and going to hell. We were once under that power. We were once under that bondage. But Jesus Christ has redeemed us from that bondage. I'll just read to you from Revelation 20, verse 6. It says here, Blessed and holy is he, this is referring to believers, Blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection. Brethren, if you're a believer, you're going to go through the resurrection. You're going to be raptured. You're going to be given a new resurrected body. And the Bible says you're blessed. And then it says this, On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. We don't have to have the fear of death, brethren. Once you're saved, yes, you're going to die physically at some point, you know, but you're never going to die spiritually. You're never going to the second death, okay? That is, that's never going to be a des- your destination now that you're saved. That power, of, that power of sin, that power of death, you no longer had. It once had you in bondage, but now Jesus turned it around. Now you have power over those things. Now you don't have to fear those things. Okay? And you say, well, do I really have power of sin, uh, Pastor Kevin? Because I still sin today. Yeah, you, actually, God has given you power of sin. And we'll cover that as we keep going through this chapter. Look at verse number 9. Ephesians chapter 4, sorry. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9. If I tell you to turn somewhere else, just make sure you keep your finger always in Ephesians chapter 4. Okay? Verse number 9 says this. Now, that he ascended, referring to Jesus Christ, he ascended up to heaven. But, uh, but is it, sorry, what is it, but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? You say, what's that about? Jesus Christ descended to the lower parts of the earth? Well, we know that he died on the cross. We know that he was buried in a tomb. But did he, what's this about descending to the lower parts of the earth? Okay, verse number 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Okay? Now, I don't have a lot of time to go through this, but just very, very quickly. Okay? And again, this is something that a lot of people cringe at. A lot of people cringe at this teaching. Okay? But actually, go to Acts chapter 2. Go to Acts chapter 2. Okay? Because I'd rather you just see it rather than just hear me preach it. Okay? Go and look at it. Acts chapter 2 verse 30. When Jesus Christ died, his body was buried in a grave. For sure. That's what the Bible emphasizes, right? The death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel, okay? That's what the Bible emphasizes. And the Bible does emphasize the physical death. It does emphasize the physical burial and emphasizes the physical resurrection of God, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, okay? That is emphasized. 
But when that took place physically, there was also some type of spiritual transaction taking place as well. And I don't have all the answers to that, brethren. I don't, I, don't have my, I don't have a full knowledge of that, okay? But let me just show you what the Bible says here. Acts chapter 2, verse 30. Acts chapter 2, verse 30. It says here, Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Verse number 31. He, seeing this, before spake of the resurrection of Christ, look at this, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. What do we see here? That the soul of Jesus Christ would not be left in hell. Where is hell? The lower parts of the earth. Where did Jesus go when he died? His soul went to hell. Okay? His soul went to hell. That's what it's saying there, right? And, and that he would not be left. But not only that it was his soul not left in hell, it says neither his flesh did seek uh, corruption. Why? Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Rose from the dead bodily. Okay? His, his flesh was not corrupted, did not rot away. He was resurrected in a new resurrected body. Okay? And then it says here, verse number 32, This Jesus have God raised up, whereof we... Are all sorry, whereof we all are witnesses. We all are witnesses. They all saw a physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. They all saw him that uh, wrote this here in, in Acts chapter 2. And uh, so that's a truth that you just can't run away from. Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. Now, I don't fully understand that, brethren. I just tell you the truth. But one thing I see, I see that's what the Bible says, and that's what took place. Okay? But that's not all. And a lot of people stop there. That's not all. Okay? Now go to the book of Luke. Go to Luke 23. Go to Luke 23. Luke 23, please. We're going to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We're going to the crucifixion here of Jesus Christ in Luke 23, verse 43. And we have the beautiful story about the thief on the cross that believes on Jesus Christ. He puts his faith on Christ, right? In Luke 23, verse 43. Luke 23, verse 43. This is what Jesus says to that thief. He says, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Few things. Today with me, where? Paradise. Say, where's paradise? That doesn't sound like hell. Yeah, it's not hell. Okay, let's keep going. Verse number uh, 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst, Look at verse number 46, so important. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my, what? My spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. So he says to God the Father, as he's about to die, Father, I'm going to commend unto you my spirit. And he gives up the ghost. Okay? The, his, where, where's God the Father? In heaven. In heaven. Okay? And I don't have time to show you this, brethren. I do have time to show I'll read it to you very quick. Oh. I'll read it to you very quickly. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. It says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, pay attention now, such and one caught up to the third heaven. The third heaven. That's where the throne of God is. That's where heaven is. The third heaven is the heaven that we're all looking forward to go to one day. And then verse number 4 says this, How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. The Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us a couple of things. There's a third heaven, that's where God's throne is, and that third heaven is paradise. That's where it is. So when Christ was on the cross, He said, Today, today, when He died, thou shalt be with me, where? In paradise. Where was Jesus then? Uh, when He died. In paradise. He was in heaven. You say, Brother Kevin, you just said His soul was in hell. Yeah, his soul was in hell, the Bible says. His spirit, his ghost, was in heaven. His physical body was in the grave. You say, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, join the club, brethren. <laughs> you know what? I'm just showing you what the Bible says. Okay? That's what the Bible says. That's what happened. Okay? And of course, we know, the Bible tells, makes it very clear, that man is made up of body, soul, and spirit. Okay? And Jesus Christ is God Almighty. I mean, I guess... He can do that, right? He can, be, he can do that. And if you go back to Ephesians chapter 8, please. Sorry, Ephesians chapter 4. What am I saying? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10. Look how he ends again. 
Verse number 10, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. You know what? Jesus Christ can fill all things. He can fill hell. He can fill heaven. He can fill the earth all at once. Because he's God. All right? He's God. And so we see that play out in the Bible, in the grave, in hell, in heaven. Now, you, you want me to expound on that? It's very difficult to be dogmatic. There's a lot of opinions, there's a lot of thoughts, there's a lot of passages that seem to convey certain things, but it's difficult, okay? I don't, I don't mind if you have your opinions, it doesn't really matter. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As long as you believe that truth, you believe the right gospel, okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And actually, if you, if you look at verse, how verse number 8 ends... We talk about uh, captivity captive, but then it says, and gave gifts to men. So I'm talking about spiritual gifts, okay? Now, notice verse 9 and 10 uh, in um, brackets, okay, are in brackets. So it's a, it's, a, it's a thought, but really verse number 11, in a way, continues what verse number 8 left off with, okay? What are these gifts that God has given uh, to the local church? The gifts are here in verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, okay? So, a church can have all these things. A church can have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, etc., okay? And some people get really stuck on, these ver on this verse. It's really not that difficult, okay? And you say, well, why is it that we don't have apostles today? Why aren't you Apostle Kevin instead of Pastor Kevin? Okay, well, you know, the, the Bible says, you know, uh, well, to be an apostle, one of the qualifications, one of the requirements to be an apostle was that you, have, you had witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, so anybody going around today calling themselves an apostle, listen, they're not 2,000 years old. They weren't there when Christ was resurrected from the dead. Anyone going around calling themselves apostles are not true. They're not true people. Don't go and listen to them, okay? They're giving themselves a title which nobody today in 2019 can possibly have. That was one of the requirements, okay? And I'll quickly read to you from 1 Corinthians 15 verse 8. Paul is speaking about himself. He says, And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. Why was Paul an apostle? Because Jesus Christ revealed himself to Paul. Physically. Remember when Paul saw Jesus Christ and he was blinded by that? Okay. Well, he says, look, I'm like one born out of due time. You know, the other apostles saw him, you know, right after resurrection. I got to see him, you know, several, several, whatever it was, you know, months later on or whatever it was, you know. And so he, he refers to himself as one being born out of due time. But he can be rightly called an apostle because he saw the resurrected Christ. Okay. Now, that's why we don't have apostles today, okay? And then it says, what about prophets? What well, prophets? Isn't, isn't a prophet someone that can tell the future? You know, Pastor Kevin, why don't you have people coming up here and telling us what the future holds? Well, you know what? Every time someone preaches about the future, I've already preached about the resurrection. Guess what? I preach about the future, <laughs> right? You know, you know, actually, the word prophet or prophesy just means to proclaim God's word. That's all it means, right? So anyone that gets behind this pulpit, anyone that preaches, anyone pro that proclaims this word, is prophesying. That's all it is. And yet, the Old Testament prophets, they told many times about the future because the people did not have a completed Bible in their hands. You know, if I just sat there and just read the book of Revelation to you for church, hey, I'm telling you all about the future. And guess what? It's going to be 100% accurate, right? I don't have to put my opinions in there. It's all there based in the Word of God. Anyone that, that preaches is a prophet. And then it says, and some evangelists. You know, there are some people, and we, we don't have this ability in our church today, but one day, who knows if our church grows and we have the finances, one day we might employ someone in the church to be our evangelist. What does it mean to be an evangelist? Someone that evangelizes. It tells telling the good news. Okay? You're going out there, full time job. Your job, you know, so we give it to someone one day maybe. Hey, your job is to basically get out there and preach the gospel. Monday to Friday. That's your job. And the church will pay for you to do that job. That's an evangelist. Someone that gets out there, preaches the gospel. And then it says here, and some pastors, and of course, I take the role of a pastor. And a pastor is a shepherd, you know, someone that's overseeing the flock, as it were, and teachers. You know, some people are more skilled to teach. You know, there are different styles of preaching. There's your preaching style, you know, someone that just opens up the Word of God and preaches the truth. And then there's other styles that, you know, it's just teaching. 
You know, you take a doctrine, you break down the doctrine, doctrine, you explain to people how these things come together. That's teaching, you know. And a pastor ought to be able to do all these things. A pastor ought to preach, yes, but a pastor also should be able to teach. Should be able to show people what's wrong, what's right, and why is it wrong, why is it right, okay? And so these are gifts that God has given. These are positions that God has given for a church to be united, for a church to grow, okay? Verse number 12, verse number 12. It says here, for, it actually tells us right here, right? the reason it gives us all these people, for the perfecting of the saints. And let me just stop there for a minute. Let me just stop there for a minute. One thing I want to say this, okay? Because I've actually heard people say to me, because, uh, you know, I've got a church up there, and I get, people, I get people to preach up there, and I've got a church here, and I get other people to preach here, right? And I, I've, I've been told, well, why, why do you do that? You're the pastor. You should be the only one preaching. Is that what we just saw in verse number 11? Is it just the pastor? Is it just one guy that gets up to preach? You know, all the churches that I've been to at the past, you know, they've always allowed other men to get behind the pulpit and preach the word. Okay? Say, so why? Because we need multiple people. Some people are gifted, you know, c- compared to others. You know, some people are able to teach a certain truth better than I can teach. You know, you might have a preacher and you might get more out of that person. Guess what? I need to take turn to sit down on the chair and listen to someone else preach at me. You know, there's been many times I've allowed people to preach behind the pulpit in my church. And I've just sat there and I've kind of disagreed with what I heard. Nothing major, just something that I've disagreed. And then I've gone back and I've studied my Bible, looked into it and go, oh yeah, I was wrong. You were right. I've got to change my mind about that. I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me. And nothing major, just small little details, small little facts. I need to go back. Oh yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad I got brother so-and-so to preach. Because now I've learned a few things. Okay? And so look, church ought not, ought not to be a one-man show. Yes, you know, I'm the main leader. Yes, I'm the pastor here. Yes, I'm guiding. But, you know, I'm, I'm all, I also allow people to, you know, if you want to preach, if you want to open the Word of God, I'm allowing you to do that. Just let me know. Let me know and, and I'll give you the time. And I'll tell you what needs to be done. I'll tell you what needs to happen. And let me just say it now. You know, you need to be baptized. We already saw in this, in this chapter that one thing that brings us, uni- brings us into unity is baptism. You know, if you want to get behind the pulpit and preach, you've got to be one that's one in baptism with the rest of the congregation. You know, that's not something that should be uh, contentious. That should just be something that you joyfully accept. Yeah, I want to be united with this church. I want to make sure that I'm baptized. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints. You know, the word perfecting there means to complete you know, to help us mature, to help us grow. That's why we have all these. It says here, for the perfecting of the saints and the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's the purpose behind it. That's the purpose we have different preachers. We have people get up here and open the word of God. It's to edify, to lift each other up, right? The body of Christ. And sometimes, yeah, you have to get behind the pulpit and tear down some false teacher, tear down some false doctrine. Yeah, sometimes I might have to expose your sins, but I don't do it to destroy you. I do it because I love you, right? I do it because I want you to be edified. I do it because I want you to wake up and go, well, I'm, I'm living worldly. Well, I, I, I'm living I, not how God wants me to live. I better change this about myself. That's not to destroy you, brethren. If you ever get offended by something I say, it's not to hurt you. Okay, I'm not sure. I, I, I want you in church. I want you growing. It's the purpose behind it is to edify, okay? To edify you, to help you grow in the Lord. Verse number 13 till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge, look at this, of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'm not sure if that's gone over your head, brethren, but the reason church is so important, okay? It said there, uh, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, okay? You come to church so you can learn about Jesus Christ. You can learn who Jesus Christ is. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the Son of God. What did He come to do? How did He, how did he behave? You know, the whole Bible centers on Jesus Christ. We can learn about Jesus Christ. Any chapter of the Bible will point us to Jesus Christ in some way, shape or form. Okay? But it's not just knowing about Jesus Christ. But once you know about, once you have the knowledge of the Son of God, it says, unto a perfect man, okay, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Once you know who Jesus Christ is, once you know what He's like, well now, the next step is for you to be like Jesus Christ. To measure yourself up next to Jesus Christ. It's not to measure yourself up next to the pastor. Oh man, Pastor Kevin's at this level, and I've got to make sure I get to that level. No, that's a low level, okay? That's a low level. Don't, don't put me as your standard. Don't put me as your stature that you're measuring up to. No, 
You know, or some other brother, oh, I feel good about myself because I'm better than brother so-and-so. You know, I'm better than sister so-and-so. Oh, you know, sister so-and-so, she's not in church this week. At least I'm in church this week. Bad measurements. No, 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 no. You measure yourself next to Jesus Christ. Once you learn about Him, you set Him as your standard, now I've got to be more like Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of church. Okay, that's the purpose of coming to church, for you to grow spiritually. And when you don't come to church, naturally you're not going to grow. When you don't come to church, naturally you're going to fall away. You're not going to uh, see Jesus Christ in your own life. Verse number 14. And this is so important. This is the title of the sermon here. It says that we henceforth be no more children. Is there a time to be a child? Yes. But you know, every child grows. Phys I'm talking about every physical child grows. They're not going to be children forever. You know, we look at little babies, we look at little children, we say, oh, how cute, how cute. You know, 20 or 30 years later, you're not going to be saying that about them anymore. Okay? They're going to be a full-blown adult. All right? And, and, and the expectation is that you, just as much as you can't stop a child from growing, the expectation is as a, as a believer, as, as a believer of Christ, you ought to grow. Okay? But here's the thing about being a spiritual uh, be a believer is you can stay as a, as, a, as a child. If you want to, you can stay ignorant. You can stay as a child with lack of knowledge and, and a lack of growth. You could do that in the spiritual life. But that's not what God wants for us, right? That we henceforth be no more children. Because what's the danger of being a child? What's the danger of being a, a babe in Christ? He says here, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. What's the problem of staying as a spiritual child? Is that you're going to be tossed to and fro. You're not going to know what to believe. One preacher is going to come up and preach something. You're going to believe that. Next preacher gets up, preaches the total opposite. You're going to believe that. You're not going to know what you believe. You're not established in the Word of God. You're being convinced by the arguments of men. Now, it's good to make solid arguments, you know, make solid uh, thoughts, give solid thoughts. But you know what? It ought to be grounded in God's Word. That's what's going to keep you stable. And not only that, it says, by the slight of men. Have you ever heard of the term, the slight of hand? A lot of magicians use sleight of hand, right? That, you know, I don't, I don't know, uh, you know, let, let's say a magician, you know, hides that cup, like, somehow makes it hide from this hand, and then all of a sudden it appears in that hand. You know how they, they did it somehow, right? And they did it by sleight of hand. They had you distracted, you know, maybe they were juggling over here or something. They had, they had your eyes distracted over there, while somehow they got that cup over there, and now you've been, oh, now it's on this hand, right? You've been deceived, all right, because of the sleight of hand. Well, the same thing happens with doctrine. The same thing can happen in a church is that there are men with, uh, that come with, with, uh, with a sleight of hand, as it were, right? Coming with false teaching, coming false doctrine, and you're not going to be able to tell the difference between what is right and wrong. It says cunning craftiness, cunning craftiness. They know how to deceive you, all right? It says here, whereby, and this thing blows my mind about these false prophets. It says, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You know what this means? The false prophet comes to a church and will sit there, just lying in wait, just waiting, 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 to the point where you're just like, well, that's a brother in Christ. Waiting, waiting, waiting for his chance, waiting for his chance. And then when his chance comes, he goes in. He goes in and brings his false teaching or whatever it is, okay? He brings in the division in the church. You know, whatever it is, he comes and that's what they do. They just wait to deceive. That's what gives them joy. That's what gives them purpose, to deceive God's people. And this is why we can't be children forever, brethren. We need to learn to grow and to mature and, and know we, what we believe because we've seen it in the Word of God. We've been convinced by the Word of God. And you're going to get that in church. You avoid church, you just listen to your, your preachers online. Man, there's a lot of p crazy people online as well. You're going you're gonna to start believing everything that you hear, you know? You ought to come to church, find a good church, come to church and learn from God's Word. Verse number 15. But speaking, so this is, the, this is what we should do, instead of being like these false teachers, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him all things, which is the head, even Christ. So when we preach the truth, we ought to preach with love, okay? With love. And you say, oh, see, brother, Pastor Kevin, sometimes you lift your voice, sometimes you get angry, right? You're a bit stern sometimes. That's not loving. Yeah, that is loving. All right, that is loving. Because sometimes you need to wake up. Sometimes you need to realize, man, am I really that sinful? Man, is that real? does God really hate that? 
And sometimes you just need the hard preaching. You just need someone to, to show the Bible and just, just show you your sin. You do it because of love, brethren. I get here, I come down here to Sydney because of love, right? I, I love you. I love this, this brethren. You know, I love this church, right? I, I love you guys. I, I do. I, otherwise, I, I just wouldn't do it. <laughs> Honestly. I just, and so people that come out to preach, make sure these people are people that actually love the brethren. They're not just people that are trying to make a name for themselves, trying to look good in front of other people. No. You know, the person that stands behind the pulpit preaching God's word ought to be someone that can speak the truth in love. Okay? Verse number 16. And, sorry, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, this whole body is speaking about the church, joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. You know, every joint of your physical body is important, right? Every joint that puts your bones together, that puts your ligaments together, your muscles, every part of the body is important. It says here, according to the effectual, effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I don't want you to miss what's being said here. What's being said here is that everybody that makes up this church is important. If you're missing a part of your body, I don't care what part of your body it is, you're going to be less effective. Okay? If you cut off a finger, you'll still be able to function. Okay? You're going to be in a lot of pain once you lose that finger. But you're not going to be able to do as much if you had all your fingers in place. Right? Or if you break your ankle, you break your leg, you can, still get, you, can still, you can probably still drive a car. But it's going to really limit how much how mobile you're going to be. Right? It's going to be a strain on the whole body. You know, when there's a part of your body that's broken, the rest of the body is working extra hard to, you know, alleviate, you know, or trying to, you know, accommodate for, that, for that, that hurt part of your body. And so everybody in this church is important. I don't care how long you've been saved. If you've been saved a day, you're important. If you've been saved for 10, 20, 30 years, you're important. If you're a man, you're important. If you're a woman, you're important. If you're a child, you're important. Everybody is important. And when someone in this church is hurting, it hurts the church as well. It hurts the body. Okay? It's important to understand this because look at, look, at, look at verse number 16. Look at the end of verse 16. It says, Maketh increase of the body. Do we want this body to increase? We're talking about our spiritual growth. But it's not just spiritual growth. If this body is increasing, guess what's happening? People are going to be added to this church. Do we want people to be added to this church? Do we want this body to grow? then what do we need to do? It said there, um, increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And I've already said this before, guys, but if we want this church body to grow, we want people to come and visit and join our church, we have to be a church of love. Okay? People will join our church for any reason. It's close. I agree with the doctrines. You know, oh, the saved brethren, or the King James only, whatever. P people can come up with whatever reason they might have to join a church. But what's going to keep them here is if they can see a love within the body. If they can know this church loves me, I can learn to love this church. And so please, when we have visitors, go out of your way a little bit, okay? Go out of your way and welcome them. Go out of your way and tell them they're welcome to church, you know? And think about maybe there are brethren here in this church that, you know, you've not spoken to for days or you've not spoken to for about for weeks. Maybe there's someone in this church you don't even know their name. I hope not, because we're a small church, right? Maybe you don't even know them. You know what you need to do? You need to go and love that person. You need to go and, and, and talk to that person. Work on that. Go and say hello. Go and say bye. You say, I, I know nothing about brother so-and-so. Well, go to, up to brother so-and-so and ask him how they're doing. You know, learn about their life. Ask him what they do for work. You know, ask him if there's anything they need to be prayed for. You know, that you're willing to do that for them. You know, it, that's showing love to the brethren. And when we have visitors come and they can see that love, they're going to want to be part of this church. Okay? If we have everything else put together, but we're missing the love, you know, yes, they'll come for a while, that they like what they see, but eventually they're going to be, well, I'm not loved here. They're going to go elsewhere. They're going to find church somewhere else, okay? So please, remember, it's not about you coming here and just receiving the love. If this is what you want our church to be, you have to be loving. You have to be the one that edifies one another. Verse number 17, This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth, Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So here it is, guys. This, this, this chapter is about our walk. It's not about our position. Our position before God is perfect. Our position before God is righteous. When God looks at us positionally, 
He sees Jesus Christ. He sees the righteousness of Christ. This is not your salvation. This is not your position. This is about your walk. Okay, your walk. How you ought to live out your Christian life. And the instruction here is don't walk as other Gentiles walk. Don't walk as the unbelievers, basically what it says. Now, how do they walk? In the vanity of their mind. Look, look what the Bible describes non-believers as. Okay? Vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their hearts. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. This is how God describes the non-believer. This is what you were before you got saved. Okay? What did it say here? Vanity of their mind. The non-believer thinks of worthless things. Okay? It says here, Igno the ignorance that is in them. They're ignorant. They, they lack knowledge. It says blindness in heart. It says past feeling. Okay? That they lack the proper emotional response to things. That they're, they're past feeling. Given to lasciviousness. That means they're full of lust. You know, that they're given to the lust of the flesh unclean and greedy these are all words that god gives about the non-believer this is what you were before you got saved okay and the instruction here is don't walk like these other gentiles meaning you can walk like those other gentiles right if you're not being faithful if you're not in church you're not growing you're going to walk godly you're going to walk worldly Okay, you either walk in the light that God gives you or you're going to be walking like this sinful world, like the non-believer. And you too can fall into this kind of description. You too can be someone that just thinks about worthless things. Okay, about the vanity of this world. And the instruction is don't walk like these other Gentiles. Don't walk like the unbelievers. Verse number 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. What this is saying is that if you walk in that way of the, of the unbeliever, it means you've not learned Christ. Okay? You don't know what Christ is like. You don't know how you ought to measure yourself up to Christ. You don't know how well you're following after Christ if you're living worldly, if you're living in your sins. Verse number 21. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus... Now, this is, this, is the, this, is the, this is what you do. This is, this is the instruction of how to walk properly once you've been taught by Jesus, once you've heard of Jesus, once you've found the truth in Jesus. Verse number 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, your former lifestyle, your former behavior. The Bible says, put that off. You've got to make a decision and say, well, this is how I used to live my life. I used to live for myself. I lived for the world. I lived for my own pleasures. I lived for my sins. Now I've got to take that and put that away. It says, you know, that's the instruction that's being said here. Putting off the former conversation, the old man. And you guys know that I love to preach about the old man and the new man. Okay? Now, does it say here that you don't have the old man? Does it say when you got saved, the old man it no longer exists? No, the old man is still there. Okay? And this is why you've got to take that old man, that old Kevin, that old sinful flesh, and say, I don't want to walk your way anymore. Go over there. I don't want you today. All right? You put him away, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's the clue, guys. That's, that's what you do. You want to put that away? You don't want to work, work, uh, walk worldly? You've got to renew the spirit of your mind. You've got to start changing the things that are up here. Okay? Instead of filling your minds with television, instead of filling your minds with Hollywood, okay? filling your minds with, with the world's entertainment, the world's music, and you know, the world's system, instead of filling your minds with all that, you've got to change what you fill your mind with. You've got to renew your mind. That's where it is. Verse number 24. And that you put on the new man. At which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The only way you can walk righteously, the only way you can walk by, uh, in holiness is by putting on that new man. You get rid of that old man, how do you do it? You renew your mind, you start thinking of godly things, you start reading your Bible, you start praying, you start coming to church, you start listening to godly music, you start opening up your hymn book, you all got a, a hymn book to take home, go and sing it at home, fill your minds with godly things, go soul winning, okay? Or have fellowship with fellow brethren that might keep you steady and on the right path. Whatever it is, guys, think on good things. Think on spiritual things. And by doing that, you'll be able to put on the new man. And you'll be able to walk there in righteousness and holiness. 
You can't think that I'm going to spend mon Monday to Saturday or you know, the whole week just living like the world, being entertained by the world, and think, oh, on Sunday I'll just go to church and I'll be all in the new man. Yeah, look, the, your, your new man will be malnourished. It'll, it'll be there, okay? It's not going anywhere. It's there. Both the old man and the new man are there, okay? It's malnourished, but you're not going to be effective for God, okay? And when it comes to the lust of the flesh, when it comes to temptation, you're more likely to give in to those lusts because you've been feeding that old man the whole week, okay? We need to change the way we live our lives. We can't continue living the same way you, we used to live before we were saved. You've got to put on the new man. Romans 12.2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, look, by the renewing of your mind. That's how you get transformed. By the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that, uh, that is that, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's how you do it. You say, well, I'm going to do this today. Well, is that good, acceptable and perfect? Is that the will of God in your life? Oh, that's not the will of God in my life. Then don't do it. That's not renewing your mind. Well, you know, I've got to go to work. You know, I've got to get up early and go work and provide for the family. Is that God's will for your life? Yes, it is. Fathers, it is God's will for you to go to work, provide for your family, do all those things. Guess what? That's God's will for your life. Hey, that's renewing your mind, doing something for other people. That's important for you to do. It's not just church. It's doing the things that God expects you, requires you to do in your life. Verse number 25. Wherefore, put in away. So this is putting away that old man. Put in away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. I'm not going to say what I was about to say. But put away lying, okay? Tell the truth, okay? The new man wants to tell the truth. The old man wants to lie. Look at verse number 26. Be ye angry and sin not. And let not, sorry, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Is this saying, don't be angry? Is this saying, never be angry? You know, some people believe being angry is a sin. Is that what it says there? No, it says, be ye angry. Hey, that's a command. Get angry. That's what it says. Be angry. But then it says, and sin not. Okay. How, how is it, you know, if, if a child does something wrong, if your child disobeys your parents, you ought to get angry about it. You know, when you see this world using God's name in vain, you ought to get angry about it. It ought to, it ought to spark an emotional response. God has put those emotions in you, okay? So it's righteous to get angry as long as you're angry about the things that God gets angry about. But don't get angry to the point where you're so angry where, you, where it says here, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, where if you're having a fight with somebody and you don't go and sort it out, or you're still harboring those thoughts, you're still harboring that anger, you wake up the next morning, you're still angry about it, or now you're sinning. Because the instruction is, yeah, get angry, but then, you know, by, by the time the day's over, by the, sun, by the time the sun goes down, don't be angry anymore. You know, sort it out, get it over with. You know, sort it out. And if you don't get things sorted out, that's when you sin. That's when you sin, okay? And then it says here, verse number 27, neither give place to the devil. When you're angry, guys, and you're just holding on to anger, when you're just holding on to bitterness, when you're just holding on to something someone's done to you, that's when the devil's going to step in and you're giving place to the devil. The devil can use you and manipulate you because you're not reacting properly emotion emotionally. Okay? The devil can take advantage of your emotions if you don't go and sort things out. Get angry, yes, but don't sin. Okay, don't sin. Verse number 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. Okay? Go to work, men. Don't steal from other people. Go and labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Oh man, I thought I went to work to give to myself. No, go and labor, right? To, to, to give, to, he may give, uh, have to give to him that needeth. You know, the things that you work, the things you labor, the things that you're productive with, find how can I bless other people? Again, the context here is the church. How can I bless my local church? And that could be money. It could be that God's blessed you financially, so you're able to give to somebody that's in need. Maybe a brother is in, finds himself in some financial situation, no fault of his own, just bad place. Hey, you might have some finances to help him get through a tough situation. 
That could be a given, right? That's possible. It's not just financial though. Uh, it could be possessions. You might have possessions. You know, there, there are ladies, I've seen this in church, and maybe you've done this yourself, ladies with children. I've seen mothers that have buy, buy clothing for the kids or families, you know, they give a lot of clothing for children and then the children never wear it because they grow so quickly or they wear it just once or twice. The clothing is still in good quality. I've seen many times mothers come with bags of clothes, giving it to another mother, you know, with children. Say, hey, look, go for this, see what you need. Hey, that's awesome. That's something you've labored for. Now you're, you're blessing other people with what you've got. So it could be clothing, could be tools. Maybe your brother needs a tool to get something done. You have that tool, go and give it to him, that need of. Or it could just be personal help. You know, I've got brother Michael. You guys know brother Michael. He's up there in Queensland. And now that I've got an extra pair of hands, he's helping me set up lights around the church building. He's doing all these upgrades on the church building that I don't have time for, but he's got the time for that. Hey, he's laboring. He's, he's helping the local body there up in Queensland. Praise God for what he's able to do. So it's not just money, but it could be possessions. It could just be you laboring with your hands, just serving one another with what you can do with your own hands. Verse number 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth and they say what is this corrupt communication well but now it's going to give us the opposite of what it is all right the opposite it says here but that so this is how we should speak but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers when we speak to one another brethren we ought to speak for the purpose to edify one another to bless one another to lift each other up you know and if your speech is destroying one another that's corrupt communication okay it said there right um let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth okay think about what you're saying to to each other you know a lot of insults are veiled you know i don't know How can, can i give, try to give an example here i've used i think i've used this example before but you know i might go up to a, you know let's say a mother with a little child right and they're in nappies, and I'm, I might say something like, oh, is your child still in nappies? Your child's still not toilet trained? Now, I haven't come out and criticized them up front, right? But I'm asking a question, I'm, making, I'm, I'm purposely making them feel bad about themselves. Well, am I supposed to have them toilet trained by now? Am I supposed to have this done, right? Well, that's corrupt communication. You're tearing someone down, you're not lifting them up. Okay, you're not lifting them up. That would be an example of, you know, we often think about corrupt communication about, you know, swear words. And of course, that's part of it. You know, that, you can tear people down by the way you speak. But it's got, it's basically corrupt communication is the opposite of edifying your brethren. Let's keep going. Verse number 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, this is a sad reality, brethren. Every time we sin, every time we walk in darkness, every time we walk in the ways we want to walk when we're, we're, we go against God, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You know, each one of us have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us. The Bible says we're a t the temple of God and the Holy Spirit of God indwells us. And so when we're walking after our own ways, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. We're grieving God. All right? And then it says here, whereby, so say why? Why did God put the Holy Spirit in us? Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is in you. You know, as, as a seal of your redemption, of the day of redemption. That is the resurrection. When you receive your resurrected bodies. When, when God has given you your Holy Spirit, He's guaranteed that you're going to be fully redeemed, even physically. Okay? This is once saved, always saved. You're sealed. You know, you're saved and you're sealed. There's nothing you can do to unseal yourself from God's Holy Spirit. Verse number 31. Let all bitterness, and I'm not, I'm not going to break all these things down, but let's just listen to it. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, okay? And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. You know what, it, when it says forgiving one another, you know what that means? That means there's going to be people that are in church that's going to offend you. That's what it means, okay? You can't forgive someone unless they've offended you to begin with, all right? So you come to church, oh, I didn't think so-and-so -and -so was going to offend me. Well, guess what? It's going to happen. This is why God gives us these instructions. Forgiving one another. Oh, man, I can't forgive so-and-so. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, have forgiven you. You know how you're meant to treat the brethren in this church? The same way you would expect Jesus Christ to treat you if you're in His presence. If you were meeting Jesus Christ face to face, whatever your, your thoughts are as to how he would treat you, man, I, I think of Christ, I'm sure he'll be welcoming. 
I'm sure he would embrace me. I'm sure he would say, thou good and faithful servant. I'm sure he would say, when I stuff up, you know, when I make mistakes, well, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> All right? I'm, I'm sure the Lord's going to say, hey, when you're weak, call on me and I'll give you strength. You know? Is that how you behave to your fellow brethren in church? Well, that's how you ought to behave. Okay? The standard is Jesus Christ. You know? How, does, how do you want Christ to treat you? Well, that's how you ought to treat your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Hey, forgive one another. If you're holding a grudge today, learn to forgive them. Go and sort it out. You know, don't let these conflicts develop. Because then you're going to have the bitterness that it's there, right? The wrath, the anger, the clamor, the evil speaking. Put that away from you, brethren. Put that away from you. That stuff that brings malice, that destroys one another. No, a church ought to be the body of Christ, edifying one another, loving one another.